Anyone who has heard this case has deemed it the most insane set of circumstances they have ever tried to understand. Just when you think you know what's coming next, another element of the truth is exposed. A couple was murdered in their own home and their seven-month-old son was found alive but covered in his deceased mother's blood. While searching for a motive and a killer, the investigation exposed online bullying, a secret CIA agent, harassment, catfishing, and manipulation. With two arrests made, they were even more to come. You are such a genuine gem. It is October. I am so thankful for you being here. We are doing podcast-length episodes every single Sunday this month. I will leave the October playlist from years before down below. And make sure you are signed up to the Genuine Gem newsletter so that you can get the upload notifications when YouTube doesn't like to do it, as well as community news, case updates, and important things coming in the future. You'll also be entered into a giveaway if you sign up in October. Now it's time for a genuine and Jim shout out and today that is Carly's a cutie face and she wants to shout out the multiple missing women in her hometown of Evansville, Indiana. This includes Andy Wagner and Donita Wilkerson. If you would like to be featured as the Genuine Gym of the Day, just comment down below a case or an organization that you would like me to feature. First, a quick mention from our sponsor, Screw Jam. So Screw Jam is actually a challenging puzzle game that helps you to test your problem solving and your strategic thinking skills to enhance your cognitive ability. This is essential to be able to keep us alert and safe as we age. This is one of the games that I play to stay on top of my game mentally, and they have a 4.7 rating on the App Store. And the game doesn't require Wi-Fi. You can remove and match the screws to build your city and problem solve, all while training your brain to have a better attention to detail. This game is so much better than using your brain power to scroll on social media, and Screwjam is actually free to download with my download link, or you can scan the QR code on the screen, and you will access the free reward pack through my download link you will get three hours of infinite lives and a hundred coins so go ahead and click that download to support this channel and better your brain now let's get back to the story. Before we dive into this insane case, I want to let you know that there are a lot of players in this case. There's a lot of names that are going to be thrown out to you right at first. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible, but it is necessary to know these names because they all factor in on this case. It was a huge conspiracy plan, murder plot, and there's just so much involved that I really hope that I do a good job of explaining it and letting you know exactly what happened and how this manipulation really caused an entire community to believe in one thing over the other. So it was 2012 in Tennessee and the town of Mountain City was said to be such a tight-knit community where everyone knew everyone. There was no secrets that could be hidden. Rumors were always spreading like wildfire and Facebook was a go-to place for communication and community news. It became an echo chamber of sorts with all of their opinions being alike. They were often talking about the minuscule problems in their areas and they were very much focused on the town. But bullying was also known to occur online between these full-grown adults because they could hide behind their computer screens. This was soon learned by the Potter family who had moved to this town about five years prior. This was Marvin and Barbara and their daughter Janelle. Now they had moved to take care of Barbara's elderly grandmother who lived in the area or her mother Janelle's grandmother and they found it very difficult to fit in with that very judgmental community who didn't easily accept outsiders. Even though they had been there for five years at this point, they were still struggling. Now, Janelle was actually a 30-year-old adult at this time, but she was still living with her parents due to her disabilities. She relied heavily on them due to health reasons. She had health problems since she was young, and she didn't have a driver's license or a job, and was said to be mentally much younger than her age. But Janelle was quite introverted anyway, so she knew how to be social without having to leave the house often, and that meant going online. She was able to enter this community 
community in ways through social media. Those who accepted her invites to be her friend were her friends not even just on the online world but in real life too. And even as Janelle began to integrate herself into the community, into reality, those real life friends became her online friends and to Janelle there wasn't much of a difference between those two worlds. Except for when her online world began to crash down around her as the unfriending and the harassment began. A 911 call would then come in on January 31st of 2012, around 1041 in the morning. This was at 128 James Davis Lane. And a man named Roy had gone over to his friend's home that morning to pick up some mail. And he ended up seeing his friends deceased. Now, Roy ran out to his car where his wife was waiting for him, told her what happened, and his wife ended up calling 911, began saying that she had found her friends with no pulse inside of their home. Johnson County 911. Honey, I need a name with a bad. He's in one room, she's in the other right at the playpen. It kind of looks like he's trying to get to her baby. They can tell by looking at their faces, they're swelled, they're black and blue, they've been beaten. Okay, do you want to attempt to do CPR? They're both dead, it's too late. There's no problem. They're white, they're dead. There's no okay. baby in Bob's Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They said that they had dropped by the home, they had found the back door open, and they realized that a shooting had occurred when no one was answering them, and found this family home turned into a crime scene. But their baby was still alive, though at this time, he was dead silent. The Johnson County Sheriff's Office Chief Deputy Joe Woodard was called to the crime scene and he would say that they only had a murder in Johnson County every three to four years. This was completely unusual. The victims were identified as 36-year-old Billy Payne and 23-year-old Billy Jean Hayworth. Billy Jean was said to be laid back and easygoing. She also had this huge personality and she was engaged to Billy Payne who was outgoing and caring and made Billie Jean laugh constantly. The two had grown up in the area, but they had actually met at the local cotton factory, Parkdale Mills, becoming friends at first and then starting a relationship. They had moved in with Billy Payne's father, and this was a brand new start for Billy Payne. He had a son from a previous relationship. He was also into drugs and partying, but with Billy Jean, he began to completely change his life around. He was settling down. He was staying home with his girl. Friends said they were basically meant for each other and then Billie Jean fell pregnant in 2010 and soon enough they had their seven-month-old baby together named Tyler. Billy Payne's father would say that he had seen the couple that morning and he had spoken to both of them before he headed to work but not long after they had been murdered. Now the sheriff's office was calling the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation to help with the investigation into the murders because they were such a small department. They found Billy in a room to the left laying near the foot of his bed with his feet hanging off. He had actually been shot at point blank range in the head and then his throat had been cut. In another room, Billie Jean was found in a fetal position lying on her left side with a gunshot wound to her right side of her head. Her seven-month-old Tyler was found in the deceased mother's arms covered in her blood. He wasn't screaming, he wasn't crying, but he was conscious and he was alive. It was obvious that he had witnessed a murder but was too small to be able to verbalize that trauma and had most likely been screaming for hours prior to being found. A bullet was actually found in Billy Payne's pillowcase on the bed where he was found and another bullet was found in the baby bouncer toy behind Billy Jean and Tyler. Investigators found that the bullet in Billy's pillow actually had an X mark on the tip, and they called this the poor man's hollow point, which is used to cause more damage to the victim. No shell casings were found, leading investigators to believe that this was done by a revolver. But investigators recreated the moments before the crime scene, finding that Billy Jean had just made Tyler a bottle and brought it to his room in order to feed him. She was taking him out of the crib just before before she was murdered. They believe that she was folded up in the fetal position because she was actually leaned over reaching for her child. The autopsy showed that both parents suffered from gunshot wounds and their deaths were homicides. Now the Johnson County Sheriff's Office found no fingerprints or DNA left behind. There was also no signs of forced entry and nothing was taken from the residence as though this was a burglary. So they had to rule out a murder-suicide before anything else. And while doing 
their search, investigators did find traces of methamphetamine in their home, and they began to believe that this murder was done by a professional. This was the doing of a hitman with the motive relating to the drugs. Mountain City began to lose their minds in fear when this news of the murder spread. And on February 1st of 2012, when investigators found that Billy used to take these pain meds and he sold drugs to his friends, they found that he wasn't this huge drug dealer. It wasn't something that he did for lots of money. He wasn't known. It was just something that he would do in his small circle, and he was getting much better since being with Billie Jean. In his late 30s, he had gotten treatment for substance abuse, and friends and family didn't believe that drugs actually had anything to do with their murders. But on February 2nd, the first suspect in this case was given a polygraph test, and this turned out to be a 38-year-old man named Jamie Curd. He had recently had a falling out with the victim and was said to have a heated exchange with Billy Payne a few months before the murders. Jamie Curd was actually Billy Payne's cousin. Now, Jamie was said to be an oddly introverted man who rarely had a girlfriend, rarely left the house, so he was brought into the sheriff's office and a polygraph test showed that he failed. He had lied about knowing the killer. So for the next six hours, he was questioned by investigators and they told a nervous seeming Jamie that they knew what he had done. Jamie began to say that he wasn't there when they were killed, but then he was asking if the CIA was there. When they asked him why he was asking about the CIA, who was not there, he said he'd been texting with a man named Chris who had told him that he was in the CIA and he was protecting someone in their community. Basically, he believed that this CIA agent was going to come and get him out of the situation and that because he had been talking to the CIA agent named Chris, he would be exonerated for any part of this. But who could it be that this CIA agent was protecting? Well, you see, Billy Payne and Billy Jean's friends and family believed that the murders could have something to do with their strange social media feud that had been happening for about a year prior. They pointed to a girl in town named Janelle Potter. Investigators were informed that Janelle knew Billy and Billy Jean after she had met a woman named Tracy at the pharmacy that she had gone to. Tracy realized that it was kind of hard for Janelle to fit in and decided to invite her to be hanging out with the friend group. Now, Tracy's brother was actually Billy Payne, and so they hung out a few times, and then Tracy invited her to see the whole group, and they would hang out on occasion and became friends on Facebook as well. They wanted to become friends on Facebook because Janelle actually did not have a cell phone that she could use to contact them, so they could message her that way. Janelle had gone to Billy and Billy Jean's home a few times to hang out with everybody, but once she said there was too much drinking happening, too many drugs, and she felt uncomfortable and she actually went home. But the feud began when Janelle began to get posts on her Facebook. They were anonymous, but they were telling her she was a loser, she was ugly, she was going to be SA'd, they were going to kill her and Janelle was certain of who was doing this even though they were anonymous. She began to believe that her new friend Billie Jean Hayworth was responsible. Janelle was trying to get her friends to understand that Billie Jean was this bad person and wanted to kill her. Janelle was calling the police on Billie Jean during these feuds and saying that what was happening online was horrific and she felt unsafe. She said that Billie Jean's fiance, Billy Payne, was also in on the harassment, that they had come around her family home, they had thrown a rock at her house with their names written on it, which was found, and there was also threats against mother and father. In fact, they threatened to blow up her father's truck. Eventually, they all unfriended each other with Janelle insisting that Billie Jean was one of the worst of her bullies. But then how did those involved in this harassment of this woman end up being the victim? Could this mentally underage woman with so many health problems be their cold-blooded killer? And would a cold-blooded killer have a CIA agent protecting her from a social media feud? Well, Janelle had confided in Jamie Curd, the first suspect in this case who had gotten a polygraph test, about her CIA protection. You see, Jamie Curd was in the same friend group as Tracy from the pharmacy, as Billy and Billy Jean, as Janelle, and he was also, of course, Billy Payne's cousin. Jamie and Janelle had actually begun to date, and when Janelle began to be harassed online, Jamie took her side and actually stopped talking to his own cousin. But investigators were very confused because they had just gone to Janelle's home after the murders, 
and had spoken to her and had gotten a completely different story about her and Jamie's relationship. You see, when investigators went to the Potter family home a day after the murders, Marvin and Barbara were in the room with their daughter, Janelle, when she was being questioned. And Janelle began to say that she learned of Billy and Billie Jean's deaths on Facebook. And she felt bad about the situation because she didn't want any harm to them, even though they were the ones harassing her. She said that she was sorry that it happened. When asked why they would be doing so, she said it was a jealousy thing, that she was too pretty. She said she wasn't involved in the deaths, but she had once gone into their home and felt very uncomfortable because they had drugs there. And she was speculating that this could be the motive for the murders. But she began to be asked about Jamie Curd and her relationship with him. And she claimed that they were only friends. Her parents then chimed in that Jamie was a family friend for quite a long time. But it turned out when Janelle began to hang out with pharmacy Tracy, Tracy had someone else that she wanted Janelle to meet and that was Jamie. So Tracy had actually set up Jamie and Janelle because they were both chronically inside alone. They were single, but because her parents were so strict, she was not allowed to have a boyfriend. Now let's not forget at this point, Janelle was around 30 years old or in her late twenties. However, due to her disabilities, her parents were very strict about what she could and couldn't do. So Jamie would often come over to hang out with the parents and then would sneak off to be with Janelle. He even bought her a cell phone so that he could communicate with her. Jamie believed that this Facebook feud between his new girlfriend and his cousin and all of his friends had gotten so bad that when Janelle came to him saying that she was being protected by the CIA, he had no problem with going up to his cousin Billy Payne and telling them to knock it off. Billy was telling him to stay away from Janelle and this is when Jamie had told Billy Payne that he was going to cut his throat someday and they stopped speaking after that. But during this Jamie Curd's questioning, he told them he could never kill his cousin and his fiance. Billy Payne and Billy Jean were buried together after having a joint funeral, but their killer was still out there. Until Jamie was brought back in for questioning and he was pressed on who shot his cousin. Finally, Jamie said one word, Buddy. Buddy shot them. Who was Buddy? Well, he was a 60 year old local man who used to be in the Marines, but he fought in the Vietnam War and was now using an oxygen tank to breathe. He always wore a gun on his belt, in fact, two of them, even when he was out gardening. He had suffered a back injury and was on disability at the time, and it would later be found that Buddy would tell stories of his time in the Marines and that he was this war hero, but they all belonged to another man. He had a wall full of pictures and medals and decorations from the military days, but they were all untrue. So at this point, Jamie would say that Buddy had entered Billy Payne and Billy Jean's residence first, and that Jamie had followed behind, that Buddy had a gun and headed to the room that Billy Payne was in, and Billy saw them, screamed, and ran into her son's bedroom. Jamie then heard two shots, and then Buddy handed him a knife. He said that Buddy had threatened him that he was in it and that he needed to slit the throat of his cousin. Jamie said he did what he was told and he gave the knife back to Buddy. Jamie was then told by investigators that he needed to call Buddy with the police listening in in order to incriminate him. And that's when Buddy would inform Jamie that he had gotten rid of all of the evidence. And this was enough to arrest him. Investigators then headed to the Potter residence to arrest Buddy. You see, Buddy was another name that Janelle's father, Marvin, went by. Jamie had confessed that Marvin Buddy Potter was the killer. When Jamie had called Buddy for the police trying to incriminate him, Buddy's wife, Barbara, had actually answered the phone and asked Jamie if he was all right, if he had passed the polygraph test, and if they had let him go. Jamie lied and said that they had, and that's when Barbara said that they were praying for him and that Janelle had even seen an angel that day that was supposed to be good news. That's when Jamie asked Barbara to put Buddy on the phone and Buddy confirmed they had gotten rid of everything without hesitation. Buddy then told Jamie that they didn't have a reason to point the finger at him because of all the stuff that Billy Payne was in. Buddy was saying that he had heard about all the gangs that Billy Payne was involved in and that the police thought it was a drug deal gone bad. Hi, 
you all right? Yeah. Did it go all right? Yeah. Did you have a lie detector? Yeah. And you passed it? Yeah. And they just let you go and that's it, it's over? Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. We've been praying our hearts out. Janelle saw an angel today. And I said, oh, that's good. Has uh, Buddy around? He got rid of everything. That was a new thing. Uh, okay. I'm not going to go up there. Buddy had no idea that they were on to him, and so on February 7th, Marvin, or Buddy Potter, was arrested at his residence, but not before trying to get his gun out of his holster. But while Buddy was in custody, a search warrant was issued for their home, and investigators collected possible evidence. They found hundreds of guns, knives, bullets. There was an ammo belt that was draped around his oxygen tank. They also found pictures of the victims in the living room, all ripped in half the cuss words on them such as the b word c word w word and they knew exactly who had ripped these photos up because investigators actually caught barbara potter ripping those pictures in half right in front of them and then in buddy's truck in the trunk they actually found bags of shredded paper they also found bullets with x's on the top of them just as the bullet that was found at billy payne and billy jean's home had Investigators believed that when Buddy was arrested, Janelle and Barbara seemed to be in shock. So Marvin Buddy Potter was questioned and was told that they knew that he was the killer. They were saying that they thought that Jamie was involved because he was secretly in love with Janelle and wanted to prove to Marvin or Buddy that he could protect her. Now, Buddy denied this for several hours. He did not believe that Jamie and his daughter were in any sort of relationship and that is when a recording of the phone call that Jamie had made to him was played for him and the color drained from Buddy's face. He still didn't budge for quite a long time, but investigators then said that they knew that he had only done this to protect his family. He then broke and said that his daughter was in danger, that she and the entire family had many threats against them. People were going to kill her and rape her because she was a virgin. He said he felt he had no other choice and that there was a $3,000 bounty on his daughter's head as well as his wife and himself. Barbara, though, was saying on this phone call to her husband that he was there the morning of the murders. Barbara was giving her husband an alibi, but Buddy was crying and confessing. And then Janelle came on the phone suggesting the same thing about the alibi that Buddy was home the whole time. Buddy then asked for a lawyer. Marvin Buddy Potter and Jamie Curd were charged with first degree murder, but the case was only getting started at this point. Jamie Curd then recanted his confession that at the time saying that the police had tricked him into signing the statement and they lied when they told him he failed his polygraph test. But Billy Payne and Billie Jean's family had a whole different side of the story as far as the harassment. They claimed that Billy Payne and Billie Jean were the ones who were being harassed, not Janelle. They also said that Billy and Billy's friends were being harassed as well. In fact, a year prior to the murders, their friend Tara had actually filed a protective order against Janelle due to her constant calling, but this was thrown out due to Tara not being a relative of Janelle. Then another one of their friends named Lindsay filed for a charge of phone harassment against Janelle, and this was actually tried on November 30th of 2011, but the judge claimed that Lindsay had not proven Janelle's guilt, so the case was dismissed. But these girls said that Buddy was often a part of the phone calls and that they would answer these calls from Janelle and he would tell them to quit calling and when they would say Janelle called us, Buddy would say they were lying and that he was going to kick their ass. The whole friend group, including Billy and Billy Jean, said that they had tried to speak with the Potter parents to ask for their help in making Janelle stop harassing them. You see, those who knew the victims claimed that Janelle called them every single day, sometimes multiple times a day. A witness even claimed seeing Janelle and her mother Barbara verbally abusing Billie Jean at a gas station when she was just simply getting gas and they came up to her and this gas station attendant saw what was going on, came out, they rushed away and Billie Jean was there, left there shaking with her baby in the car. Due to this, a harassment complaint was actually filed against Chanel, but it was thrown out for lack of evidence. 
It was also said by this friend group that Janelle was posting things online, such as Billie Jean and that damn baby needs to die. The Bureau of Investigation had taken the evidence from the Potter family home, such as the bags of shredded paper, and they had put together 174 pages of emails and Facebook posts to the point of being readable once again. Now, these were between the Potter family and a man named Chris, the same name that Jamie had given as the CIA agent. All the members of this family and Jamie had spoken to this man via email. He was telling them that he was looking out for them in person and online. He was watching the people that were harassing them. And it was believed that Marvin Buddy was actually being told about these emails and they were being printed out for him because he did not use technology. So he wasn't emailing in any way, but Barbara and Janelle were printing these off to show him, which is why they had to be shredded. But Chris was said to write very aggressively, often talking about how he hated people and he killed them, but it was legal because he was in the CIA. His emails were said to be grammatically incorrect and he had the tendency to keep the E in words where he was adding the ING at the end. But Jamie, Janelle, and Barbara all wrote back to him, confiding in him. Barbara even began to call him son. She just wanted to meet up with him. But Chris was often traveling for work, always making time to come back to Johnson County though to watch Janelle's enemies from afar, sometimes speaking about the possibility of killing them. Barbara would write back to him saying things like this and said, as long as you are doing the right thing for mankind, then you will not be judged badly. If it is like Buddy did, you are helping others by getting rid of the bad. I understand what you do fully if it is like Buddy did. I worry about when you retire though. Don't let it ever get you down, Chris. During a conversation with Jamie, Chris had actually written to him saying, she really loves you, man, talking about Janelle. She has never loved anyone like she loves you. I see it all over her and you are very blessed for sure. You have a great girl and these mother effers just want to make her life hell. And I hope she don't think about you to live for and her mom and her dad. And this was sent three months before the murders. Two days later, Chris sent another email to Jamie talking about Janelle's bullies saying, they just love to pick, but from what I know, something will happen to them in time. With you and Buddy, I hope you all can get them. I hope it all works out great. I hope that you will pray about it and Buddy is, and that you known that what you are doing is great. You're going to help the town. I wish I could kill them right now. I really can't. Buddy's wife, Barbara, at this time was saying that when they arrested Buddy and he had made this confession, he didn't have his medications on him. He didn't have his oxygen tank. And this had led him to giving a false confession. She did not believe he could have murdered anybody. He had never been violent before. He had never broken the law. And she was also saying that Buddy had worked in the CIA at one point, but she didn't know details because he was supposed to keep that part of his life private and he wasn't allowed to talk about it. Now, this is actually a very known thing that Buddy was in the CIA because not only would he often talk about his time in the Marines, but he would also say during that time he was in the CIA. And in fact, in 2007, when they had first moved to Mountain City, Marvin Buddy Potter had gone to the sheriff's office in Johnston County and told them that he had been in the CIA and was expecting to be reactivated at any time. He was waiting on his notice on where to report to and that he had killed in the past, but it was in the line of duty. Duty. He was letting the sheriff's office know as a courtesy. Buddy was talking about this time of his life often. He said that he led a CIA mission that wound up killing a whole village that was not supposed to be harmed. And he said because of that, it was wiped off the government files. Now, this was a mission, a story that never actually happened. In fact, Buddy was prosecuted prior to all of this in federal court for claiming military honors he did not possess. So at this point, investigators wondered if this CIA agent Chris could really be Buddy. And then they realized that Buddy didn't necessarily get on the computer or knew what he was doing. And so then they thought maybe it could be someone connected to Buddy's past. So investigators traced the IP address from Chris's emails and they found a residence. This traced back to the Potter family once again, in particular, Janelle Potter. The emails were between bmp9119 at aol.com, which was Barbara's email address, and bull2dog at aol.com, Janelle's email address, where she pretended to be Chris. 
There was no Chris, no CIA involvement. Danella had become a catfish after meeting Billy Payne and Billy Jean and finding out that Billy Payne had moved Billy Jean in and they were having a baby together. This was a year before their murders. Investigators believed that this man was created by Janelle in order to confirm her story of harassment and threats coming from this friend group to her parents. Why? Well, investigators believe that Janelle was in love with Billy Payne and her jealousy had gotten to the point that she wanted him dead. She knew exactly what to do to get her father to do so. In these emails, Barbara was said to be especially frank with this Chris, telling him that they had enough and that no one wants to kill anybody, but they will. They would say that they needed peace and for people to leave them alone. Chris was warning them that he would kill them all and that Billy was the one trying to kill Janelle. Anytime Chris came back with an update about the people harassing her daughter, Barbara would show Buddy. Janelle would then show her boyfriend, Jamie. Yet these were written by Janelle herself. Janelle was also found to use many aliases online, on online forums for the community. She would talk badly about Billie Jean and her friends, Lindsay and Tara. Nine months prior to the murders, she had written, all three of these girls are no good and sell drugs and drink. If you ever hit Janelle, Lindsay, your ass better watch out. She don't even know you. And you all always have to pick on her and hurt her and her family. She has a great name and you were all so unhappy with your dumb little lives. And you, all you guys do is sleep around and make people's lives hell. Why don't you go back to effing hell where you came from? Keep on effing with Janelle. She had a lot of friends that will back her up and know what's really going on. All you effing sluts know what to do is hate on someone else because you are not happy with your damn lives. Her other aliases would then respond to that post claiming to be more of Janelle's friends. And if you think that I'm completely butchering these emails and how they're written or spoken, that is just how they're actually written. There's a lot of grammatically incorrect portions of these emails. In fact, they all are grammatically incorrect and often don't make sense. She was also found to be pretending to be the victims of Billy Payne and Billy Jean's friends, emailing herself with the threats. One said, Janelle, I will get you no good B. I'm effing Lindsay. Remember that. So these harassing posts and emails that Janelle was complaining about and horrified about were seeming to all be made from her account. And with the manipulation that it takes to become a catfish and to trick those around you into believing this story, investigators began to believe that maybe Janelle wasn't as innocent and naive as she presented. Janelle had created many more catfish identities as well, all men who were meant to be protecting her. The night before the bodies were found on January 30th, around four in the morning, investigators found a text that Janelle had sent when she had heard a car leaving. She had texted Jamie that she loved him and to text her as soon as they got back. At this point, the state took the case of Janelle and Barbara Potter to a grand jury to see if they could charge them with criminal responsibility. And after the grand jury heard about an hour of the case, arrest warrants were issued for both women. They were located at the Johnston Memorial Hospital where Janelle had been admitted and they were taken into custody. So a year after the murders, Janelle Potter and her mother, Barbara Potter, were arrested for murder as well. And this is mainly due to the Tennessee law that one is criminally liable for the crime of another when they have solicited, directed, aided, or attempted to aid the other in committing the crime with the intention that the crime can be completed. Now, the prosecution just had to prove this, and both women were adamantly saying that they had nothing to do with it. Janelle even claimed that even though Chris's emails came from her email address, she had been hacked. She was not Chris. But while the prosecution got to work on how they were going to argue that Janelle and Barbara were involved in the murders when they weren't at the crime scene, the actual people at the crime scene, Marvin Buddy and Jamie, were brought to trial. So on October 7th of 2013, Marvin Buddy Potter's trial was first, and this was the opening statement from the prosecutor. The child was not harmed, but had been left there in his mother's arms and his dead mother's arms by someone who was cold enough, calculating enough, and trained enough to be able to conduct murders like that. Ladies and gentlemen, today in this courtroom, we are going to show you that you are in the midst of someone trained and cold-blooded enough to do that kind of thing. At least he thinks he is. He likes to tell people he's that kind of person. He likes for his family to think he's that kind of person. 
The defense was claiming that due to Buddy being off of his oxygen at the time of the interrogation, he was not thinking clearly. They were pointing to another gunman entirely, one that could have been using the meth that was found at their home, since it was not in Billy Payne or Billy Jean's systems. It was stated that the bullets found in Buddy's truck did have the same markings as the bullets used to kill Bill Payne, but the bullet used to kill Billy Jean was so mutilated they couldn't actually determine if those same marks were present. Now, the man who had found Billy and Billy Jean inside of their home was their friend named Roy, and he would testify that when he walked in, as he was allowed to do to get his mail, he was calling out to make sure that he didn't catch them in any sexual acts. But when he didn't get any answer and their car was still in the driveway, he began to look around a bit, and he walked into their room and found Billy lying on the bed. He thought he was sleeping, so he walked over and started shaking his arm before he realized he was dead. He started backing up and ran out of the house to his wife, who ended up calling 911. And when Roy went back inside the home, he found Billie Jean and saw Tyler still breathing in her arms. He ended up pulling Tyler out of her arms, but the baby did not make a sound. Now, the audio recording of the interview from the Potter family the day after the murders was played for the jury, and they heard Buddy answering the door by saying, I know you're going to question about this thing, I guess Billy Jean and them. I figured you'd be around. Everyone always points fingers at us. At this point, during that questioning, the agent said they just wanted to make sure that Janelle didn't have anything to do with it, and Janelle was the first to say that she had been in bed, and that she couldn't even drive. And then Barbara chimed in saying she wasn't strong enough to do that, and she agreed, she said, especially with a guy, a girl, and a baby. Buddy then said that Janelle could not to do that to anyone even if she wanted to. But Janelle then interrupted Buddy saying she could kill someone if they were trying to rape her. But Billie Jean's friend, Lindsay, who was also said to be harassing Janelle, but then it was found that Janelle was actually harassing them, would testify about how this whole feud began. Lindsay would say that after Janelle hung out with the friend group, they all friended her on Facebook. Soon after, she went about posting that they were mean girls. She would take pictures of them from their Facebook pages and post them on her own. Lindsay said she called Janelle and asked her to stop, and Janelle said she didn't know what she was talking about. She didn't write anything. Lindsay denied ever harassing or even calling Janelle bad names. She said she just wanted Janelle to stop. But he was said to be expressionless by the prosecution and he was refusing to testify. He was then sentenced to two life sentences and when the prosecution spoke to the jury, they asked if they thought Barbara and Janelle were involved and one of the jurors said that she felt that they were guilty, particularly Barbara. And so the prosecutors who were also trying to come up with the case against Barbara and Janelle saw this as a very good sign. So in 2015, Jamie Curd, who was about to go to trial, would end up talking to the prosecution. And he would say that every time he had gone to that Potter residence, Barbara would give him a long update about all of the harassment they suffered. And every time she ended her speech by asking Buddy what they were going to do about it. He said that he often worked on their computer at their home because it was old and it froze up every month. But after quite a bit of talking and getting Jamie comfortable with them, the prosecution finally got him to talk about Janelle. He said he thought that she loved him, but looking back, she didn't, that he was being played. Jamie believed that Janelle actually desired Billy Payne and once before Jamie had gotten involved with Janelle, Billy was actually talking about seeing Janelle, but Billy said she wasn't his type. Soon after Jamie and Janelle began dating, Janelle started talking about eloping. But as soon as Billy got involved with Billy Jean, Janelle began to get very angry, saying that she was just another one of Billy's girls that he would throw away. Jamie said that Janelle spoke differently with him than she did with her parents, that she knew how to get what she wanted out of them. So Jamie would end up pleading guilty under a plea deal for 25 years for the murder of his cousin because he was going to testify against Janelle and Barbara. So in 2015, Janelle and Barbara would have a joint trial and the prosecutor's opening statements laid the groundwork saying there is nothing in your lives or backgrounds that has prepared you to understand the Potter family. You have never seen anybody like them. This story is very, very simple. It's a story of a manufactured conflict born in the mind of a very bored, lonely 30 year old woman. It's the seed that grows into a tree and it's not just that seed, it's all the water and the fertilizer that's put on that seed to make it grow and bear fruit. 
and all of that happened as the result of Janelle Potter's actions. The defense, though, claimed that this was a case of hacking and that since Jamie couldn't have Janelle for himself, he actually was setting up the Potter parents for murder so that he could have her. But digital evidence was going to be used against these women. You see, the prosecution claimed that there was evidence against Janelle showing that the IP address for Chris was her email, her home, and that the spelling that was often incorrect in his emails also matched Janelle's way of spelling. The prosecution also said that the emails were consistent with somebody who was mentally eight or nine years old and that Janelle was believed to be mentally much younger than her age. But then the defense took that and they claimed that because she was mentally eight or nine, she couldn't have come up with this plan and masterminded a murder. A little more was learned about Janelle at this time. She actually had type 1 diabetes that wasn't well taken care of. She had an auditory disability and was in special ed classes all throughout high school until she graduated. This is actually when you can hear, but you cannot process what you are hearing. She was said to normally never leave the house unless she was with her parents, and she was receiving Social Security disability checks at the time, and neither her nor her parents were working. When the defense asked the jury to describe Janelle in one word, they said things like scared, ordinary, worried. Janelle was adamant that she was not Chris, and that is when the real Chris was brought in to testify. That's right, he was a real man. Chris to Jaden testified that he believed he was Chris the CIA agent, or the man that was used to create this identity. You see, Janelle and Krista Jaden had known each other in high school and had spoken a few times but hadn't spoken since. And as soon as Krista Jaden entered the courtroom, Janelle was not able to keep her eyes off of him. Chris denied being a CIA agent or emailing the Potter family at all, but he did believe he was the model for this man. His photos were even used in Chris's social media. Jamie Curd was then brought in to testify and explain that the night before the murders, Barbara had called him over to work on the family computer and Buddy came in and then asked him if he would do him a favor. He asked Jamie if he would drive him down next to Billy's, let him out, and then go down the road and come back and pick him up. Jamie didn't know when this was supposed to happen, but he did agree and he then left to go home. He later got a call from Janelle that her dad or her daddy wanted him to help him do something in the morning. She then texted him and told him not to bring his cell phone. Jamie said that he and Buddy then drove and waited for Billy Payne's father to leave before they entered the residence. Buddy handed Jamie a gun and Jamie told him he couldn't kill anyone. Buddy told him that he wouldn't need to, he just needed to stand at the door. Jamie then stated to the court that he felt manipulated by the Potter family. He thought that Chris was real and it was all a lie. And when he was asked if Janelle and Barbara conspired with him in the crime, he actually said no, that he had never talked to them. However, just from his statements, Barbara was the one to call him over in the first place. The prosecution then brought in Dr. Robert Lennard, a professor of linguistics who had led the forensic linguistics program, the first one of its kind. He wanted to compare the computer writings of Janelle to the writings of the men who she had allegedly catfished. And Dr. Lennard and the prosecution had worked together to obtain typed letters from Janelle through the police department. And they then realized how similar the writings of Janelle and Chris really were. The defense then brought in two expert witnesses, a cybersecurity expert who argued that IP addresses can only point to a device and not a user and that anybody in the Potter house could have been typing as Chris, meaning the prosecution couldn't confirm that Janelle was Chris, but they also brought in a neuropsychologist who evaluated Janelle and said that she did operate as a child. But then when asked if a child could be manipulative, they said, yeah. As far as Barbara's involvement, in her emails to Chris, she would write things like, if someone wants to bring it on, they will all die, including the baby. And they're not going to get Janelle. There's no way between our heavy ammo and protection of her at all times and your alls, they're going to get the surprise of their lives. And then two weeks before the murder, Barbara had actually searched on the family computer, can God forgive a murderer? 
The prosecution stated that these two women attempted to aid Buddy in his mission to kill through their emails and statements, meaning that they had criminal responsibility. Janelle and Barbara refused to testify, and they were both found guilty on two counts of first-degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. Both women began to cry. The judge claimed that this was the most bizarre and senseless killing that he had ever heard in his 40 years in the criminal justice system. They were both sentenced to two life sentences. But that's not where it ends because just because they refused to testify didn't mean that they didn't want to speak. They both agreed to a 2020 interview while behind bars and Barbara continued to say she didn't even write any emails to Chris saying that she wanted Billy Payne and Billie Jean to die. That someone else wrote them or changed them or hacked her. She said she believed she would go to heaven and that she loves her daughter and her husband but she won't go to prison for them. Janelle then got on camera and denied that she was catfishing as Chris. And when the 2020 interviewer refused to back down on this, she refused to finish the interview beginning to cry. Did he ever talk about the kinds of things he did for work? A lot of killing, a lot of killing people. It seems to me that you are either completely innocent and blame this in this, or you are an exquisite liar. Well, what do you believe? Now the whole Potter family is in prison. Or are they? Janelle actually had a sister who was six years older than her. This was Christy. And she would be found and she would actually testify at the trials, but she would say that when Janelle was born, all of the focus went to her sister due to her disabilities. Christy said that her mother Barbara was delusional, irrational, and difficult to be around. Then Janelle began to act out and was arrested several times as a teen, but her parents never punished her. Christy said that Janelle would attack students verbally and physically, and so Christy actually moved out of the family home after college and she didn't speak to her family. She was estranged from them. She tried to rebuild the relationships, but it always ended badly. She even once brought her fiance to meet her parents and then Janelle threw a tantrum and caused a distraction. She even had to file an order of protection against her mother when she was living with her grandmother because Christy said that Barbara was beating on her grandmother's window before forcing herself inside and threatening Christy. Barbara said that Christy hit her and threatened her with a knife. Christy said that Barbara's own brother had problems with her and that Buddy's entire family didn't like Barbara. Christy said that she believed Janelle was smarter than her parents thought. That when they were younger, she would act like she couldn't do things. And as soon as they did it for her, she would show she could do it when they left and started giggling in front of her sister. Christy also claimed that if Janelle was ever confronted with a lie, which she often did lie, she would scream and get very angry like having a tantrum. She said when Janelle was in middle school, she had been told that a girl had attacked her and caused serious head injury and that when they went to court, Christy was told that this girl had admitted she had hit Janelle because Janelle was too pretty. Christy also said that back in 2010, two years prior to the murders, her mother called to see if she was home. You see, Barbara had gotten a call from the police saying that they had found her daughter roaming the streets and she was being held at the station. Barbara didn't believe that Janelle could do this and believed it was her other daughter, Christy. But when Christy called the police station, it was Janelle and they claimed that Janelle admitted to sneaking out of the house in order to meet her boyfriend. She was going to run away from home. She had packed a bag and everything. Yet her parents claimed that it was just because her blood sugar dropped and that Janelle did not even remember leaving home. But that is when they actually had the falling out with Jamie and Jamie was no longer allowed to come over, but he had called him saying Janelle no longer loved him and that caused a tiff in their whole relationship. But Christy believed that her mother and her sister should be punished for the murders because she believed her father wouldn't have done it without being manipulated into it. Christy would also learn that she had been spoken about in the emails between Chris and Barbara or Danelle and Barbara. Chris was saying that, that Christy was out to get them. And Barbara had written, you are welcome to shoot any of them, Chris, but let Christy's body be found. We have life insurance on her, so we may as well collect it. I know that sounds mean for a mom to say, but she hates me and wants me dead as well as dad and Jen. What can I do? She'll get me someday, not here and soon, or have me killed, I'm afraid, when I'm helpless someday. Worried. Sad face. Now, Christy would disclose that Janelle was not allowed to have boyfriends, not allowed to be after midnight or drink or smoke. Her parents had rules for her, even though she was a 30-year-old woman. She even had her Facebook pages looked over by them. Barbara and Janelle shared a family computer, but Marvin was said not to have anything to do with the technology, meaning that Janelle was writing those emails as Chris on the same computer that Barbara was opening and answering those emails from Chris, the CIA agent. In fact, once Buddy had gone to the police about these harassing messages 
and he was told to basically just throw out his daughter's computer, but Buddy said that she stayed at home all the time and that the computer was all that she had. Christy would also admit that when her mother and her sister were arrested for murder, Barbara was actually handcuffed, taken outside of the hospital, and she was standing right there because she worked as an EMS, and Barbara looked at her and muttered something her way. They will be eligible for parole in 2073, but as far as the baby who survived, Tyler, he is being raised by Billie Jean's mother. He would be around 12, 13 years old today. In 2019, Barbara filed a petition for a new trial citing a conflict of interest because her attorney also represented her husband. This was granted in July 2021, but by November, she actually pled guilty and admitted to her part in the murders. Janelle said that investigators didn't look outside of the box, that they wanted someone to blame, and they blamed her. She wanted a new trial because her father was not called to testify in her case. But Marvin Buddy Potter then fully confessed to the murder of Billy Payne. He said it wasn't a plan, that he had to kill them, but he did. That 10 to 12 seconds after the gun went off, he heard another shot coming from the other room. He said that Jamie flew past him like a bolt of lightning. Marvin then said that his wife and daughter played no role in convincing him to kill. Do you think that Marvin Buddy really believes that? Did he ever realize he was being manipulated by his whole family the whole time? Or is he still under the belief that he did this on his own accord? Or did he? Did he know exactly what he was doing? The lead prosecutor on this case, Dennis Brooks, actually wrote an entire novel about this case called Too Pretty to Live, which I used in order to find the information about this case, but I'll have it linked down below if you want to read it in its entirety. What do you think about this insane case? Did you see all the twists and turns coming? Could you believe it as it was being exposed? Because I could not. Who did you think Chris was? Did you think he was an actual CIA agent? Do you think he was another member of the story? Did you know it was Janelle from the beginning? There are so many questions I have for you. Please leave all of your opinions down below. I'd love to hear them. And go ahead and leave me a case or organization you would like to be featured if you would like to be the next Genuine Gym shout out. And also make sure you're signed up for that Genuine Gym newsletter so you're never missing an upload. And don't forget to download Screw Jam to get three hours of infinite life and 100 coins for free with the link in my description. Don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay. Bye.